That takes us to the statement of cash flows. This really is a pretty complex topic and different professors teach different things in an intro to accounting class. So I'll hit the highlights, but you might have to work with your professor to get into more details. The good news is the statement of cash flows isn't anything new. We don't do any journal entries in this chapter. We don't do adjusting journal entries. You take the same general ledger you had before, and all we do is rearrange the numbers from the financial statements to explain the change in cash. It's a pretty simple idea. If we think about our basic accounting equation, cash plus all your other assets equals liabilities plus stockholders equity plus net income. We'll assume the net income hasn't already been closed. So moving those other assets to the other side, the cash equals liabilities plus stockholders equity plus net income minus other assets which then means the change in cash equals the net income minus the current assets minus the current liabilities. And that's what we're going to call cash flow from operations. It's what cash you get from just your normal operations. Again, accountants aren't too creative in titles. The change in the long-term assets is the cash flow you get from investing into your company. So buying new equipment, selling new equipment. This is one of the places where while you like to see positive cash flows from operations, it's okay to see negative cash flows from investing because that means you're buying more equipment than you're selling. And then lastly, cash flows from financing. We'll take anything kind of that has those normal credit balances and look at the changes in long-term liabilities and stockholders' equity, and that's how you financed your operations. So this is the basic format of the statement of cash flows using the indirect method. You start with net income. You add back any cash, non-cash expenses like depreciation. You then subtract your current assets any changes in those, and you add back changes in current liabilities. So while I say subtract current assets, that's assuming it's an increase. If it's a decrease, then you subtract a negative, so that's really adding. So you have to remember that it's the change that I'm looking at that either adds or subtracts. You then have to do investing and then financing, and those three have to go in that order. Don't get creative at this point operations, then investing, then financing. At the very bottom then, you come up with the net change in cash and that better equal the change in cash on your balance sheet, otherwise you've messed up. So the good news is you know if you've done this right and the bad news is you know if you've done this wrong. You'll get that change in cash and you'll be so happy you finished and it worked. You'll turn it in and forget to add those next two lines you have to add the beginning cash balance from the balance sheet and then sub add that to your change in cash. That should give you your ending cash balance. We're trying to explain cash so your final balance needs to equal the cash balance on your balance sheet. Now every statement of cash flow problem is a little bit different. And for most of the changes, you just look at this year's balance minus last year's balance to get the change. But occasionally they'll ask you to determine what the transaction was that caused the change. So here's some tips and tricks to get you through those problems. The basic one is use a T account when all else fails. So let's say retained earnings has a beginning balance of 500,000 and an ending balance of 1,220. We also go look at the income statement and we find the net income's a million. So when we look at that T account, it clearly doesn't balance. To make it balance, we need a debit of $280,000. So the only reason we debit retained earnings is for dividends. So we must have paid dividends of 280. And so that goes on our statement of cash flows under the financing section. So if you look at the 
statement of cash flows on the prior slide, you'll see we paid dividends of 280 and we have net income showing of 1 million. The other place that you'll often have to solve is with the equipment or other fixed assets. So again, let's say we look at the balance sheet and we see the beginning balance was a million six, the ending balance was a million five ten, and somewhere in the problem it tells us we purchased four hundred and thirty thousand dollars worth of equipment. Again, that clearly doesn't balance, and so we must have a credit of 520 over there to make that thing work. Well, the problem is I I most likely sold some equipment, but I probably didn't sell it for 520. That's just the original cost of what I sold. So somewhere in the problem, it's going to give you some other information. So we'll assume we go look at the income statement. We see there's a gain on sale of equipment for 220. And let's say that we're told the book value of that equipment was 400,000. Some of you, again, can just think through that and figure out how much cash you got from the equipment. But I always think it's easier to do the journal entry just so I have all the numbers written down. So I know the equipment went down by 520. It told me there was a gain of 220. Because the book value is 400, my accumulated depreciation has to go away of 120. So I can back into the cash being $620,000. That cash amount goes under the investing side of the statement of cash flows because you want the cash that you received when you sold the equipment. So that's 620. That gain on sale is a non-cash transaction and so that was on our income statement and increased our net income so we're going to need to decrease our net income by the 220 uh, to get the cash flow from operations so you need to do the journal entry because the cash goes under the investing side whereas the gain adjusts your income that also uh, changes what happens on our accumulated depreciation because that debited accumulated depreciation for 120. So if they don't give you depreciation expense, you have to solve for that. So again, what I have in my accumulated depreciation doesn't balance yet. I need another $500,000 credit to accumulated depreciation. So the debit for that would be what goes as depreciation expense. If you just want to go back to the statement of cash flows, if you notice my non-cash expenses are neither the 500 or the 220, but the difference because both of those were non-cash transactions that were used to come up with the amount that I adjusted net income on that statement of cash flows. But as I said, every problem's different. Sometimes they'll give you the gain, sometimes they'll give you the book value, sometimes they'll give you everything you need and you don't have to solve anything. But it just depends on how complex your instructor gets on this topic. So that's all there is, folks. Have a lot of fun working through these. They're like big jigsaw puzzles, so they're kind of fun but they're also frustrating when you can't find that last piece to put the puzzle together.